I began earlier this morning asking if you remember either how old you were or where you were when you felt that first itch from chickenpox. I'm just going to read a couple of the answers from online. Michelle Baby was in second grade. She was in Mrs. Barrett's class, and she had an itchy belly. And when she lifted her shirt, there it was, the first pox. But it was no surprise, because her brother was home recovering from it as well. Dulce was about six, and she was at home. Her family actually lived in Alabama, and she still has a small scar on her face. Bev was in home where she grew up on Hooper Road. And uh, poor Bev, the nasty chicken pox got all over her head and her mom shaved her hair off. Sharon was actually in high school and she had a light case of it, fortunately, but her younger sister got it very badly from her. John Poffs uh, was filling J.D. in on, who was too young to remember that he was two when he got chicken pox, and they were in Virginia Beach, and all their friends and sitters had kids sharing it all around. And Norma doesn't exactly remember the itch, but she does remember that it was bad enough that she got scolded by her mother because she wouldn't stop scratching the itch. If you have ever had the chicken pox and you are old enough to remember it, then that itchiness all over your body is not something that you are likely to have forgotten. Our kids were six and three when they came down with the chicken pox, and I remember it. It was Good Friday, and we lived in Claysville, Pennsylvania, and every year on Good Friday, the whole community gathered for a Good Friday walk, and we would start at our church and have a short service in the sanctuary, and then the youth would carry an eight or ten foot wooden cross, much like the one we have now up in the sanctuary, and they would lead the procession, and we would go to different stops throughout the town, and at each place we would acknowledge the sacrifice that Jesus had offered for us as we remembered that day long ago. And so on that, that Good Friday, we had finished the service at our church, and the four of us were in the procession walking down the hill to the Baptist church. And we got to the Baptist church, and we were standing outside waiting to go inside. And Nathan turned to me, and he just said, Mommy, I itch. And I looked, and sure enough, there were those first few pox peeking out from his clothing. And so I grabbed him, and I whispered to Tim, and he and I left and went back up the hill to our house. Kristen and Tim finished. They went to all the stops on the Good Friday walk, and they got to the cemetery, when always the last stop was in our local cemetery. And just then, Kristen turned to Dad and said, Daddy, I itch. And the quarantine began. Some of you, especially if you are younger, might not have been able to answer that question, either because you somehow escaped that misery or you got the vaccination. Talk about vaccinations is in the news and on our lips right now every day. When will a vaccine for the dreaded COVID-19 be available? Will it be safe? How effective will a vaccine be against this disease that has stopped our world in its tracks and caused so much pain and loss? Will it be effective against mutations of the virus? Will the side effects be uh, bad associated with the vaccine? Will life ever return back to normal when enough people have been vaccinated that we achieve herd immunity? COVID-19 is only the latest of many contagious diseases. Because germs are all around us. And the fancy word for germs is pathogens. And they exist all the time in our environment and in our bodies. Now, normally, our immune system can handle the daily germs that we encounter by the ways that God created our bodies to work. 
our skin, our mucus, the cilia, those tiny microscopic hairs that prevent pathogens from entering into our lungs. They all help germs from entering our body in the first place. But when a pathogen does infect the body, it triggers the body's immune system to attack the pathogen, to fight off the disease, and to start producing antibodies to protect that person from the same pathogen in the future. Scientists have used this knowledge of how our bodies were created to work to develop vaccines. Vaccines contain a weakened or an inactive part of the pathogen that will not cause a full-blown case of the disease, but will activate the immune system and create antibodies to be able to fight off the disease. So as we are thinking so much about vaccines and immunity these days, I am wondering if our physical bodies are not the only thing that can get inoculated. You see, I think that we can become spiritually inoculated as well. We get just enough of religion or just enough of church to give us this very low-grade desire to pursue faith which protects us from getting a full-blown case of commitment for Jesus. Listen to the story of Nicodemus, who is exposed enough to the rantings of other religious leaders that he started to develop antibodies against Jesus. But somewhere deep inside of him, the Holy Spirit was at work, preventing him from becoming immune to the faith. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. Nicodemus was convinced that Jesus was a teacher sent from God and a miracle worker. And not only that, but it seems like the rest of the Pharisees knew this also. I really never noticed it until earlier this week, that Nicodemus said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher sent from God. We know. There had to have been a lot of discussion about Jesus among the religious leaders. And even though they hated to admit it, they knew that Jesus was a miracle-working teacher sent from God. They knew but they didn't like it. And so they closed their minds and their hearts. 
and they produced uh, enough antibodies to be able to fight off the dangerous possibility of believing in Jesus and that it might make them have to rethink their whole lives. All of them except Nicodemus. So one night under the cover of darkness, he went to Jesus. He didn't want others to know, but he couldn't stay away. He had grown up in the faith. He was known as a scholar and a religious leader, but he still had questions. And he sensed that there was more to life and to faith than what he already knew. And he had the courage to look for the answers to his questions. It's interesting, though, that before Nicodemus could even ask that first question, Jesus preempted him and told him what he was lacking. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. Now, at first, Nicodemus misunderstood what Jesus was saying because there are three different meanings for that word that Jesus used for again. And we wouldn't know this because we don't have an English word that has those three different meanings. But in Greek, there is. And so Nicodemus thought that when Jesus said born again, he meant to repeat something that had already been done. And so he got stuck on the absurdity of this literal picture of being born again, of this grown man having to enter into his mother's womb and being born again. But Jesus was describing a different kind of rebirth, not one where you have to enter into the womb again physically, but one where you experience a spiritual rebirth of water and of spirit where your sin is washed away and the spirit of God takes up residence in your heart. It's the kind of rebirth that the New Revised Standard Version translates here as born from above. Another meaning of that Greek word. So did Nicodemus get the answers he was looking for when he came to Jesus that night? We can't be sure because there's no more record of Nicodemus saying anything more that night. We only have a record of what Jesus said But if you go further in the Gospel of John, you will find two more brief stories about Nicodemus that sure sound like he learned what Jesus meant by being born anew or born from above. And we can even imagine that he was surprised by the joy of finding answers to his questions and his longings even though it meant he would have to take a stand against his closest colleagues and friends. By the seventh chapter of John, the Jews were already seeking to kill Jesus. And on that day that's recorded in the seventh chapter, Jesus had dared to proclaim in the temple that he was from God, and God had sent him to earth. And the Pharisees and the priests were enraged and they sent guards to arrest him. And so beginning in verse 45 of chapter 7, it says, then the temple police went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, why did you not arrest him? The police answered, never has anyone spoken like this. Then the Pharisees replied, surely You have not been deceived too, have you? Has any one of the authorities or of the Pharisees believed him? But this crowd, which does not know the law, they are accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus before and who was one of them, asked, Our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they are doing. Does it? They replied, Surely. You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and you will see that no prophet is to arise from Galilee. 
Nicodemus dared to stand up to his colleagues, but he was very careful to do it from a procedural standpoint. We should follow our own laws for judging people, he said. He didn't profess his belief in Jesus, but he clearly set himself apart from the rest of the religious leaders who were enraged by Jesus. And it seems like his question did diffuse the situation because even though they sneered at him, John says simply that after the confrontation, everyone returned to their home. The third and final time that we hear about Nicodemus anywhere in Scripture is on the day that Jesus was crucified. He was already dead, and the Sabbath was approaching, and there was no place to lay his body. So John 19 tells us, beginning in verse 38, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fears of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This time, Nicodemus, who had previously gone to Jesus under the cover of night, joined Joseph, another timid disciple. And together in broad daylight, they carried Jesus' body away, along with a hundred pounds of spices and oils to honor him with a proper burial. Without any words recorded, Nicodemus chose to stand with Jesus instead of the religious leaders who had demanded his death. I wonder if if Nicodemus was a friend of the gospel writer, John. I say that because John is the only one to mention anything about Nicodemus in the entire Bible. He was also privy somehow to what happened when Jesus and Nicodemus were alone that first night together. Jesus told Nicodemus something that night that has become the most well-known scripture in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believeth in him would not perish but have eternal life. How did those beloved words get into Scripture if Nicodemus had never spoken about that evening? It's just another confirmation to me that Nicodemus thought he had things figured out until he got an itch he couldn't ignore. And he became a seeker ready to discover what it means to be born anew or born from above. It still happens today. Today, I've been thinking about how Nicodemus's story can speak to all of us. And I realize that many of us are seekers like Nicodemus, sometimes without even realizing it. We've grown up in the church or with a Christian worldview, and we've been exposed to Jesus just enough that we think we understand what it means to be a Christian. 
but we still have this hunger for more. Sometimes it's unconscious. So tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Sure. I grew up in a family where religion was something you did outside the home, not something that you lived all the time. My mom was an elder, and my sister and I went to Christian summer camps and did Sunday school most of the time. My dad ushered three or four times a year, but he was never really involved in church. We didn't practice any of the spiritual disciplines at home or talk about faith at home. There's, a doubt in, there's no doubt in my mind that I understood and believed in Christianity, but at best I was a passive believer, but I was comfortable with what I believed. As I grew up, I got involved more outside the home where my background and basic beliefs allowed me to be an effective supporter of this church for many years. That's an interesting way of describing it because over the years, uh, lots of people have shared with Tim and me that they were supporters of a church before they actually had a relationship with Jesus Christ. So what do you think changed for you? I don't know. I was always a little jealous of folks who talked about a transformation and a hunger for God's word at some point in their life, a time when the Holy Spirit came alive in their life in a big way. Since then, I had a couple experiences of my own that stand out as important moments when I felt the Holy Spirit come alive for me. On the first trip to Kenya, the team had experienced a very emotional morning. We'd been distributing shoes and feeding children at a local school. On the way back to where we were staying, we stopped and prayed, and I was overwhelmed in a highly unexpected and emotional moment. I remember it well, Art. Uh, you are always that rational, even-keeled person that we need on mission trips, and we all knew that something important was happening inside of you because you suddenly got choked up and you weren't able to speak about what was happening. You know, that's that, that's funny because I that's kind of kind of amazing because uh, I remember very clearly being emotional, but I certainly don't remember anything about uh, doing anything that anybody else would recognize what, that something was going on. Hmm. Um, more recently, or several years later, and anyway, at a more recent trip to Kenya, I stood before this congregation and publicly professed my belief in Christ as a savior, as my savior for the first time. More recently, uh, many of you remember Pam's testimony about her experience with the Holy Spirit at a dunamis conference in Montrose. Later that afternoon, I was spending time doing what I normally do, which is trying to make sense out of what was said and what I'd seen that morning. I guess I must have looked like I was a little worried or concerned because two leaders of the conference came over to me at different times during the day and said, do you want to talk about that? Or do you want to pray about that? Or maybe do you want to do both? Um, the amazing thing is when I came home, I felt a joy and belief in Christ that stayed with me for about a week. It didn't come from, it didn't come from me because I hadn't been able to recreate that feeling since. We talk about head knowledge versus heart knowledge. This is a real and confer, this, this was real and confirmed in my heart. And I knew what I knew was in my head. Born again, born again in the spirit? Yeah, probably, but it doesn't mean I have figured everything out. I still struggle with spiritual disciplines. I still think over everything I say, making spontaneous prayer and small group discussions difficult for me at times. It took me hours to put to think about and what I was going to say today. But I also know when it's really important, the Holy Spirit steps in. From the eco transitions discussions in 2005, to the time Tim asked Pam and I to pray with couples during services several years ago, and halfway through, Pam turned to me and said, it's your turn. I remember absolutely nothing about what I said during that discussion. I even had to ask the couple we prayed for whether what I said made sense. And then I gone with the Alpha Table discussions in the sanctuary last year, where the Holy Spirit never failed to come through and made it easy for me to talk about my faith. I feel comfortable with my relationship with Christ, but feeling comfortable is not enough. I also, de I, I also need, I, I also know I need to keep growing. Hmm. That's good. Um, you know, it's kind of in, in one sense, hopefully we're always all seekers. Like we come to understand who Jesus Christ was and we want a relationship with him, but there's always that next thing to learn. 
And uh, so in that sense, we always want to be seekers. So I just thank you for sharing where God has already been at work in your life. And we're trusting that he's going to continue. So thanks, Art. Thanks. So the interesting thing is that you never see Art Davis jumping up and down or giddy or bubbly. That's not Art's nature. And so that's not what joy looks like in his life. But Art is someone who thought he understood what being a Christian is about. And for him, it was believing in God and being a good person and serving in a church. Until he dared to seek more and discover what it means to be born from above. Art was surprised by joy. And you can be too, if you are willing to seek after Jesus. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, would you forgive us for being complacent? Either because we've learned a little bit about you and think it's not worth learning more, or because we've learned a lot about you and think it's enough. Create a constant hunger and thirst within us to be seekers who want, as that old song says, to see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly day by day. Help us discover authentic joy that gives us a settled assurance, a quiet confidence, and helps us make a determined choice for you. Always you, Jesus. Amen.